Well, good morning, everyone. I hope that uh, you made it through the Christmas season unscathed. I know that uh, gatherings with uh, friends and family carries its own risks. I mean, we had a great time. I'm not, I'm not giving some kind of veiled confession. Well, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Slade Reinhardt. I'm the youth minister here at uh, Fellowship Bible Church, and I also oversee our adult Connect and Grow ministries. As you already heard uh, Bailey read, we're going to be in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 7 today. So if you're not already there, go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. And for those of you who are new or visiting, this is the 12th sermon in our Unity in Action series, which is a sermon series going through the book of Ephesians. There's Faith Carroll. Hey, Faith. She's, she's been at A&M, so I haven't seen her for a while. Uh, and thank you all for not whooping when I said that. What was I saying? Oh, yes, the 12th message, yes, in our Unity in Action series, going through the book of Ephesians. Uh, but even though it is the 12th message in this uh, series and the messages do build on each other, if this is your first time here, you won't feel lost because the uh, messages stand alone as well. So you don't have to feel the need to get up and leave at this time. All right, we're going to go back to the 1930s. You guys know that I'm fond of uh, interesting stories from history. There was a man named Raymond Robbins who was a noted economist who often worked with the White House on various issues in the early 1930s, and in September, September 3rd, 1932, he was uh, supposed to meet with President Herbert Hoover, but he never showed up, and he was last seen leaving the City Club in Manhattan. Well, his disappearance made headlines because uh, not only was he fairly well known, but of course his disappearance was discovered because he was supposed to be meeting with the president, and people speculated that perhaps that uh, he was a victim of organized crime. But there were also reported sightings of him acting strangely while wandering through the streets of Chicago. Well, in November, Robbins was discovered living under the name Rogers <clears throat> in a small town in the mountains of North Carolina. Robbins had apparently showed up to this small town about a week after he disappeared and claimed that he was a miner from Kentucky. He lived in a boarding house, he spent most of his time prospecting, and he became actually a very popular figure in the community. However, even though he had by this time grown a beard, which I guess is what you do as a prospector, right? Have you ever seen a prospector with a smooth shaven? <laughs> by this time he had grown a beard, but there was a 12-year-old boy that recognized him from a photograph that had been circulated in the newspapers, and so he contacted the authorities. Robin's nephew then journeyed to this small town to identify him, and he didn't recognize him. I'm sorry, that Robbins didn't recognize his nephew, and he had no memory of his previous life. But after reuniting with his wife and undergoing psychiatric treatment, he finally started regaining his memory. It was speculated that a combination of stress and emotional strain brought on this bout of amnesia and caused him to just assume a new identity. Now, Think for just a second about these people in this little town in North Carolina. So this guy shows up and he claims to be a prospector, or he claims to be a miner from Kentucky. <clears throat> Why were they not suspicious? Well, the reason they weren't suspicious is because he acted like a miner. He spent most of his time prospecting. He actually did what you would expect him to do. So he was acting consistently with his identity. Now, as believers, we have an identity. We have an identity as children of God. But our temptation is to live in a way that contradicts that identity. And just like Mr. Robbins here, sometimes we live in a way that would make people think that our identity is something other than it is. So uh, before we dive into the passage, I do want to give a brief review. So if you look at this chart that uh, our lead pastor, Todd Malone, Created that shows the structure of Ephesians. The first half of the book is mainly doctrinal. It's talking about what God has done. And then the second half of the book is mainly practical, meaning the practice of our faith, talking about what the Ephesians, or in our case, what we should do. <clears throat> I think one of the most important lessons to take from the structure of this book, and, and uh, Paul's epistles pretty much all follow a similar pattern, but one of the most important things to take from that structure 
is the, that it highlights the truth that God must act first before we can act. So you cannot live for God until God has acted to intervene in your life, to bring him to yourself and to remake you. God must first do something for us and in us before we can live for him. This section that we're going to be looking at today, which is uh, the one in black. I'm sorry, Neil, go back just one. Uh, the, in black, live as children of God. You'll notice some similarities to the previous one. Can you all remember the previous one? That was November. You all remember that? You'll notice some similarities, but because, of course, it's phrased differently, there are different things that Paul wants to bring out. But ultimately, it is about living as children of God, living consistently with the identity that we now possess. Okay, you can go ahead. Sorry about that, Neil. There are three commands uh, in this passage that sort of frame it, and uh, so we'll look at those in turn. The first command is this. Don't partner with unbelievers. Don't partner with unbelievers. Look again at verses 7 and 8. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Now, verse 7 raises two questions in my mind. And the first is, who does them refer to? Do not become partners with them. And what does it mean to become partners with them? Well, the word them refers back to verse 6, which said this, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Them refers to the sons of disobedience mentioned in verse 6. Children of God are not to become partners with the sons of disobedience. So perhaps that raises another question in your mind. Who are the sons of disobedience? Because it kind of sounds like a motorcycle club. The sons of disobedience. If that's not already taken, I may want to patent that. Uh, copyright, whatever you do. <clears throat> well, the sons of disobedience, uh, simply speaking, are, is talking about unbelievers. Unbelievers are people who are still dead in their sins. They have not trusted Christ. They haven't been made new. They're still in their natural spiritual state. And the natural state of mankind, the natural spiritual state of mankind, my natural state, your natural state, is the state of disobedience with respect to God. It's it's the state of rebellion against God, and that is why unbelievers are called sons of disobedience. So he starts off and says, do not become partners with unbelievers. Do not become partners with sons of disobedience. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to partner with a son of disobedience? When I was a student at Letourneau University, George Bush the first was president, uh, when I was a student there, there was a teacher one time that was talking about this very issue, and he brought up the example of a man that he knew that had gone into a business venture with an unbeliever, and eventually it turned sour because of some issue that had come up. And he said that is why we should not go into business with unbelievers. So in his mind, what this is saying is one of the partnerships that, are, that is being prohibited is a business partnership. Well, is that what he's saying? Is it wrong for us to have a business partnership? With an unbeliever. Or how about partnering in a social sense? Should you avoid gathering with unbelievers at an event like Downtown Live here in Longview, hanging around, listening to music, buying overpriced food from food trucks? <clears throat> well, it's always difficult to generalize because, of course, any, uh, every instance will have its own specific considerations. But uh, I can say confidently that this verse is not saying that we shouldn't engage in business or social partners with unbelievers because in the previous section, Paul mentions several sinful things like sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talk, crude joking. And then he says, do not become partners with unbelievers. So what he's talking about is joining unbelievers in their sinful activities. Don't partner with them in what they are doing that is wrong. So going in with an unbeliever to purchase something is not partnering with an unbeliever in a sinful way. Going with, in with an unbeliever to rob a bank, that would be partnering with... <laughs> I'm sorry, I wish I could have come up with a better uh, example. I realized that was not very close to life. Uh, so he said, when he says, uh, do not become partners with unbelievers, he's saying you do not join them in their sinfulness. Now, why would a follower of Christ even be tempted to do this? Why is it that Paul even felt the need to tell the Ephesians, guys, do not partner with unbelievers. Well, one of the reasons, there, there are probably a dozen we could come up with, but one very common one is just to fit in. 
you're around a group of people that are doing something wrong and you don't want to stand out in the crowd or you don't want to put any relational distance between you and them. You don't want things to become awkward, so you just, you just go with the flow. Let me give you an example. Maybe you're with a crowd of people at your office Christmas party and several people in the group start talking badly about your supervisor. Now, it's a lot easier to just laugh with the group and maybe throw in a few disparaging comments of your own than to step up and say, hey, guys, let's, let's not go this direction, or maybe bring up some, some positive things about your supervisor to point the direction in another, uh, excuse me, point the conversation in another direction. But that's an example of partnering with unbelievers because you're joining them in their sin. And I think he also means... If you are with someone and they are going in a sinful direction and you approve of it, even if you don't uh, partake in it, that would also be partnering with an unbeliever. Romans 1 and 2 refer to this. How, how, <laughs> I'm always throwing and dropping things, aren't I? Have y'all noticed that about me? I'm not clumsy, I promise. So the Lord is not forbidding you to partner with unbelievers on a work project or a business enterprise or social activity like your office Christmas party, but he is telling you to avoid partnering with unbelievers in their sinful ways, either by joining in with them or by giving your approval to it. And for the sake of clarity, for the rest of this message, whenever I mention partnering with unbelievers, that's what I'm talking about, I'm talking about joining them in their sin or approving of their sin. Now, thankfully... Paul does not just throw this command out here to stand on its own, but he follows up with a reason, and actually there was a reason that was given just prior to that verse as well. So uh, we'll look at those for just a minute. The first reason is implied by the therefore at the beginning of verse 7. He said, therefore do not become partners with them. Now as I already mentioned, verse 6 refers to the wrath of God coming on unbelievers because of their sinful deeds. So one reason, one very strong motivation to not join unbelievers in their sinfulness is that their sinfulness incites the wrath of God. Sinful deeds, sinful attitudes, sinful actions make God angry. God hates sin. God hates sin in unbelievers and God hates sin in believers. So if you are doing the things that God hates, you are doing exactly what unbelievers do to incite God's wrath. Since you love God, you will want to do what pleases him and not what he hates. God loved us, <clears throat> gave his son for us to be one with him, and therefore in return we love him because of what he's given to us. If you are giving in to greed, if you are consumed by accumulating money or possessions, if you're pursuing owning things as your path to happiness and contentment, that's an example of covetousness and idolatry. And if you're giving in to that, then what you are doing is partnering with unbelievers in their dark deeds. So God calls you to recognize it for what it is and to fight against it using his strength. Fight against what God hates because you love God. One of the most basic aspects of a believer is that they love God. It is simply natural for us because of what God has done for us and the change that he's worked in our hearts. So that's the first reason to not partner with unbelievers because it's God angry. Did I just lose my, did, did something pop? Am I good? Y'all hear me? Okay, still nodding, good. Uh, that's the first reason to not partner with unbelievers because it makes God angry. And we love God, we don't want to do what makes him angry. The second reason for avoiding sinful partnerships is given in verse 8. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. At one time you were darkness. You were darkened in your understanding of reality. You were enslaved to sin. You were under the power of the evil one. You were blind to the glory of Christ. At one time then, it would have made sense for you to live in sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness. It would have been perfectly consistent with your values and with your worldview and what you loved. But that's no longer true. Christ has set you free from slavery. Christ has broken the rule of the enemy. You can now see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Colossians 1.13 says that the Father has delivered us from the domain of darkness... And transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. You are now a child of light. Who lives in the kingdom of light. That is now your identity. And just as it is ridiculous and inconsistent for that economist. To pretend to be a minor. 
it is ridiculous and inconsistent for an unbeliever, for, excuse me, for a believer to live as an unbeliever. <clears throat> Indulging in sin is antithetical to your new identity. When you were darkness, when that was your identity, partnering with unbelievers in sin was consistent with who you are. But now that you are light in the Lord, partnering in sin works against your values. It's in opposition to what you hold most dear. Do not partner with unbelievers. The second command that he gives in this passage is this. Walk as children of light. Look at verses 8 through 10 again. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now, as has been mentioned several times as we've gone through this series, because it's mentioned throughout the book of Ephesians, whenever he says walk, he's talking about the course of your life. So another way to think of it is live as children of light. Live this way. Behave this way. This should be your lifestyle. This is what should characterize you. Earlier in chapter 5, he said walk in love, and now he's talking about walking in light. In other words, live consistently with your identity. Everyone who trusts in Christ is a child of light, so it is foolish to live as a child of darkness. 1 John 1, 5 says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Since God is light, then everyone born of God is a child of light and of course, the verse actually says, uh, excuse me, verse 7 said, you are light in the Lord. You were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. And a child of light lives differently than a child of darkness because they have a different master. They have different values and different loves. First John 1, 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So what does it look like to walk as children of light? Verse 9 says that light produces all that is good and right and true. Goodness, righteousness, and truth are the fruit of light. They are produced in the light, a life of light. These are the qualities that characterize you when you are walking in the will of God. You're good to others. You are righteous in your dealing with others. You speak the truth to others. And that is the life of God being manifested or displayed in your life. When you yield to the Holy Spirit within you to think and speak and act in accordance with God's will, then your life produces light. Now, I recognize because we are all still fallen people and we have not been glorified and perfected that our production of these qualities of light is going to be inconsistent. But if you look over the course of someone's life, someone living under the kingship of God, you will see the fruit of light in their life. <clears throat> this parenthetical statement about the fruit of light can serve as a heart check for all of us. What fruit is being produced in our lives? How are others in our lives affected by us? If the fruit of your life can't be characterized as good and right and true, then you aren't walking as a child of light. As I mentioned before, Colossians 1 says that when you put your faith in Christ, when you believe on him for the forgiveness of your sins, then you're transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Your status changes from son of disobedience to beloved child forever. Now he is saying live out of that identity. You're not living well or godly, you're not living a godly way in order to become a child of light. He's saying because you are a child of light, live this way. Live out of the status of being a child of light. The second half of the sentence and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord modifies or describes the first half. In other words, you walk or live as children of light by trying to discern what pleases the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 says, we make it our aim to please him. So what are some ways, and I'm going to allow for some audience participation here. What are some ways we can please the Lord? Just shout out a few. Getting married. Getting married. That's right. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Very good. Not living in sexual immorality. Someone over here said something. Spread the word. Yes. Spread the word of God. The good news of Christ. Study the scriptures. Excellent. Yes. Gathering here with the body of Christ to give God the honor and worship that he deserved. We could probably come up with hundreds if we put our heads together. And as you grow in maturity, 
you're going to be able to better discern what pleases the Lord. Uh, for instance, Hebrews 5 says that mature believers have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. The Spirit of God within you will use the experiences of life to help you grow in your understanding of pleasing the Lord. Walk as children of light and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. One author summarized it this way, the supreme practical rule of the Christian's life must be to please Christ. Think about that. You should live your life by this rule, please Christ. Now, I hope that everyone in here is rightfully convicted by that statement, just like I am, because all of us fail <clears throat> to please Christ consistently and at all times. But one thing I do want to add to that statement is that the purpose of this command is not to get you to live in a constant state of low-grade guilt. So God's not just trying to get you to think, man, I know I'm not pleasing the Lord all the time, so he's probably just always scowling and disappointed and angry with me. That is not what's going on here. That's not the purpose of any of God's commands. Romans 8.1 says, there is Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, the heavens were opened and the Spirit of God descended in the form of a dove upon Jesus. And then the Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my Son with whom I am well pleased. Jesus always did what was pleasing to God. Jesus always pleased the Father. And when you trust in Him, all of that fantastic record of spotless righteousness is given to you. So God treats you as if you're always pleasing to him. <clears throat> you are completely accepted and beloved in Christ forever, and you can rest in that, even if you feel like you're a total screw-up. Rest in your faith in Christ, knowing that it's his work, his righteousness, that earns your place in God's family. This command was given not to condemn us, but to give us direction and purpose for our lives. Now, when you do give in to sin, when you do realize that you have a sinful habit, you should confess that. You should confess that to the Lord for what it is and receive his forgiveness. But do not just sink into a hole of self-condemnation. Receive that forgiveness. Ask God to give you the strength to fight that sin and live your life knowing that you are fully accepted by God on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done and not how well you do at pleasing him. <clears throat> Walk as children of light by trying to discover what pleases him. The last command in these verses is expose the works of darkness. Now that sounds, <clears throat> excuse me, that sounds kind of like the charge that an aging wizard would give to a noble knight about to go on a quest. Expose the works of darkness. But all of you as children of God and children of light have been given that charge to expose the works of darkness. Look again at verses 11 through 14. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Verse 11 refers to the unfruitful works of darkness. Sinful deeds are indeed unfruitful. They do not produce anything good, whereas earlier he had just mentioned that light does produce good. It produces what's good and right and true. It's a reminder that if you think that living a sinful lifestyle will bring you happiness, contentment, or lead you to the good life, that you are deceived. Because the good life is life with God. The good life is life in his light. <clears throat> Verse 11 says, excuse me, to expose the work of, works of darkness and not to take part in them. So how do we expose the works of darkness? Verse 12 says that it's shameful even to speak of the evil deeds done in secret. So on one hand, he says expose their evil deeds. And on the other hand, he says don't speak of their evil deeds. It sounds like we're being told to do contradictory things, but of course we aren't. Verse 13 helps to resolve the issue. It mentions that anything that is exposed by the light becomes visible. So we expose the works of darkness by exposing them to light. And what that means is this. As we shine the light of Christ around us and around unbelievers, their sinful deeds are exposed to the light of God. 
Arthur, author Mark Roberts puts it this way. We expose the works of darkness by announcing the good news of God's grace in Christ and by living in such a way that this good news shines forth. We have to live in such a way that deeds of darkness are seen to be fruitless in comparison to the abundant fruit of light that grows in our lives. You expose the works of darkness by walking as a child of light and by shining the light of the gospel in the lives of unbelievers. In Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. When an unbeliever sees you living a life that is characterized by goodness and righteousness and truth, they are exposed to light, and that light helps them to see that their sinful lifestyle is wrong. And if you bring the light of the gospel to an unbeliever and they receive that as truth, then they become light in the Lord. As it says in verse 13, anything that becomes visible is light. Living a godly life and announcing the good news of the gospel pushes back the darkness around you. Now, don't get the idea that the Bible is saying you should never confront someone about their sin. That isn't what this is saying. There are lots of situations where you need to speak up and tell someone that what they're doing is wrong. You have a friend that's cheating on his wife or stealing from his employer or lying to his parents. Your friend needs to be called out. Your friend needs to be told what you are doing is wrong. It is sinful. It is ungodly. That is part of exposing the works of darkness. But the emphasis in this passage is on the lives that we live shining his light and thereby exposing the darkness. And the caution in verse 12 is probably more about talking to others about someone's sin and getting enjoyment out of all the dark details. Y'all ever found that temptation and somebody did something so terrible and I just can't wait to talk about it with somebody else and just, mm, just feel that, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's just awful and you just want to talk about it. <clears throat> you can talk about sin in a way that draws you into sin and that's what, of course, you should not do. That's what that verse is talking about. Now, Paul ends this section with a very interesting quotation, and it's interesting because he starts off and says, therefore it says, which is usually a formula to introduce a quotation from the Old Testament or sometimes from another New Testament book. But that phrase, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you, that's not found anywhere else in the scripture. So here's what we kind of think is going on at one of two things either paul has taken bits from several places in the old testament and kind of put them together to make this this particular phrase or he's quoting from a an early church hymn that was sung there awake uh, oh sleeper i think we'll call it that awake oh sleeper tyler can you write that song i'd like it in the key of c That was the bump. I did that, didn't I? I'm sorry. Uh, I shouldn't have talked about the song, should I? Where did I go? Oh, yes. Okay. So, regardless of where it came from, okay, this is in Scripture, okay? So, it's, it's, it's authoritative and uh, God breathed. So, he says, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And he ends it there because I think he's emphasizing the evangelistic thrust of us living as children of light. So when we live as people of light, when we are living in ways characterized by goodness and righteousness and truth, and when we are sharing the good news of the gospel, it is calling those who are lost to life. Awake. Awake to your sinful condition. Arise from the dead and Christ will, come, Christ will shine on you. Displaying light by living a godly life and announcing the gospel is a call to the spiritually dead to come to Christ, who will shine his light on all who do come to him. So how do you respond to the light of Christ within you? By living a life that is consistent with that light, by walking as a child of light. And how do you respond to the darkness around you? By exposing the darkness with light, not joining in the darkness, but bringing God's light to those in darkness. Here's the point. Live as children of light. Please the Lord and push back the darkness. If you are a believer and you're backsliding, which means that you are running from the Lord, you have drifted, drifted far from him, you're living in rebellion against him. 
You need to hear verse 14. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You are a child of light, so you should live to please the Lord. Admit your sinfulness and come back to Jesus. He will cleanse. He will forgive. He will restore you. He will accept you. If you are not a believer, then you need to hear verse 14 as well. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You are spiritually dead, alienated from the life of God, but this morning you have been exposed to light. Respond to that light by admitting your sinfulness and coming to Jesus for forgiveness and life. There may be people in here that have been rejected by others in the church in the past. People that have been avoided by others because of some sin that was discovered. But I can guarantee you 100% that Jesus will not do that. Jesus will receive anyone that comes to him, regardless of how black, dark, and horrible is your past. <clears throat> he said in John chapter 6, 37, all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. At the end of the service, there'll be people here across the front of the stage that would be overjoyed to talk to you about knowing Christ and to pray with you. Now, in addition to those two examples, I have a few other thoughts for how we can respond to these verses. First of all, as we uh, have been doing all this series, one great idea is to rewrite this passage in your own words, because then you have to really think about what it's saying so that you can rephrase it for yourself. Rewrite Ephesians 5, 7 to 14 in your own words. Another thing you can do is tell a fellow believer something you've learned about pleasing the Lord. Remember that he said living as a child of light or walking as a child of light is about trying to discern, trying to examine and understand what pleases the Lord. Now, I realize that sounds a little bit awkward, so here, here's what I mean. Think about some lesson that you've learned about following the Lord during your life as a believer. I'll give you an example. For most of my adult life as a believer... Whenever I would give in to a temptation and then recognize that I've sinned, I would uh, feel like that I need to give some time before I could come to the Lord to ask for his forgiveness. Depending on what I had done, it might be hours, it might even be days, because I felt like, well, I've made God angry, I've crossed this line, and so I need to let things sort of settle down before I approach him. Or maybe in my mind, I was thinking I could sort of earn my way back into his good graces. And then about two or three years ago, uh, I encountered someone who kind of taught me this lesson that the Lord wants you to immediately come to him because you are never coming to him on your own merit. Me waiting five, ten hours, or five or ten days would do nothing to make that sin any lighter, would it? It would do nothing to diminish his grace or to strengthen his grace. So I learned that to please the Lord when we immediately run to him when we realize that we have sinned, immediately go to him forgiveness, for forgiveness when we give in to temptation. <clears throat> Share something that you've learned with a fellow believer this week. Another response would be to pray and ask the Lord to reveal your sin and, ask and enable you to turn from it. That's one of the ways you can try to discern what pleases the Lord. I can say with confidence that every person in here has blind spots. There are things that you do that are wrong that you don't think are wrong. There, it's sort of like... Uh, you know how before you're married, you have a lot of annoying habits you're not aware of, and then you get married, and then your spouse lets you know that you have these annoying habits? It's kind of like that. We all have these blind spots with respect to sin as well. So go to the Lord and ask him, Lord, show me. Show me what I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing that I'm not even aware of. And the Lord would delight to help you with that and to help you fight against it. And lastly, share the light of Christ with someone far from him. Now this could be a fellow believer who's drifted away from the Lord, or it could be someone who doesn't know him at all. Tell that person about the goodness and mercy of Jesus. Tell them what the Lord has done for you, how he's forgiven you and brought you into his family. You are the primary means that God uses to bring his light to others. Live as children of light. Please the Lord and push back the darkness. After the service ends, as I mentioned earlier, there are going to be some people across the front of the stage. They'll be happy to pray with you about anything, whether that's you don't know the Lord and you would like to, you're far from the Lord and you'd like to come back, or just that you're struggling with some trial or, or difficulty. They'll be happy to encourage you to pray with you and just bring the Lord's uh, uh, presence to bear on that situation. So why don't you all stand and...
Prayer team, you can come on forward while I pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of your great Son, Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the light of Christ that you have given to us. We thank you for the marvelous privilege, O Lord, it is to know you. And thank you, God, for reminding us that we should live as children of light, that we should pursue pleasing you as our life rule. God, I pray that you would give us the strength to do that. Turn our wills each day to point toward you. And when we fall, God, I pray that you would remind us that we can immediately run to you and receive your forgiveness and restoration. And God, I also pray that every believer in here would be able to rest in Christ. That they would be able to rest knowing that they are accepted, they are beloved, and that God delights in them even where they are right now, imperfect and immature. God, I ask for your grace over any that don't know you, that your spirit would draw them. Help them to see that they are lost and alienated from you and that you are standing here with your arms wide open to receive them into your family. God, I pray for a special measure of grace on everyone who has come here today. I pray that their week would be blessed by you. In your holy name, amen. God bless you all. You are dismissed.